Venezuela is in a state of crisis. The crisis advances each day, and friends of the Bolivarian regime are worried, not just in Venezuela, but in different parts of the world. We get emails asking what is going on in Venezuela, and this is an attempted explanation. It is not an explanation which tries to give equal weight to the government or the opposition. It is an explanation which tries to explain the objective conditions that prevail in the country today and how they are being used by the opposition to topple a regime which is an elected government, which is not due to have a presidential election till next year, but to bring that process forward. Now, if this were only being done from within Venezuela, it would be one thing. But there is very little doubt that this orchestration of constitutional coup d'etats, like the one we saw in Brazil, which toppled the PT government and removed President Rousseff from office, is part of a growing pattern to bring intransigent sections of the continent back to heel. And those planning this live in Washington, D.C. and its surrounds. They've been distracted for a long time by the wars in the Middle East, which still continue to occupy most of their attention. But the American empire has decided that enough is enough, and no regime that exists in South America, which is hostile to US interests, political and global, uh, should be tolerated. And so we are seeing an escalation of the crisis in Venezuela today. On the 10th of May, one day before we are recording this program, opposition demonstrators in Caracas set fire to the Hugo Chavez Maternity Hospital. This was part of their violent street campaign to topple Nicolas Maduro, the elected president of the country. This is now their only demand. President Maduro refuses to be pressured into resigning before the presidential elections that are scheduled for next year. The situation is close to an impasse with the United States EU-backed opposition determined to provoke either outside intervention or a military coup. Ominously, U.S. troops are on maneuvers with Colombian and Brazilian paras close to the Venezuelan border. The only world figure of repute, repute that is in the Western world mainly, but increasingly also elsewhere, the Pope in the Vatican, in sharp contrast to President Trump and EU leaders, has called for an immediate end to opposition and state violence and appealed for negotiations. He has been denounced by opposition supporters for this sin. Why so much hatred? It's almost as if the opposition leaders have completely lost their cool or have been promised that if you make the country ungovernable, something will be done. And who has promised them this? The U.S. Embassy? It would be very foolish to try and topple the Maduro government by force. And let's be clear about one thing. No government in the world today, especially the United States and many of its uh, EU satellites, would think twice before declaring states of emergency. Despite huge pressure from within his own ranks and from his own side, Nicolas Maduro has not decided to crush the street rebellion of the right-wing opposition. He has tolerated it, except when they go too far. 
like attempting to set a maternity hospital on fire, I assume for no other reason or for no rational reason except that it's named after Hugo Chavez. And the aim of the opposition is clear. They want to erase the memory of Chavez and Chavismo and Bolivarianism from Venezuela. They say it. They will destroy everything done by this regime. They will reverse the reforms. Those opposition leaders who said that many of the social gains would be preserved was denounced. He then uh, reneged on his views. So the opposition is in a mess. The only thing that unites them is the desire to be in power again. Once they remove the regime or think that they've removed the regime, they will be at each other's throats. Have no doubt about this. All this goes back to 1998, a crucial year in the history of modern Venezuela. After decades of oligarchic rule, embedded in a duopoly, where two political parties effectively shared power, Christian Democrats and Social Democrats, politicians associated with them and their clients were so corrupt that some were actually seen at airports carrying huge amounts of money. That was uh, a scene described in a newspaper. Against these self-serving, corrupt governments which had lost any vision of taking Venezuela forward. Chavez won in 1998 with over 50% of the vote. He meant business. They weren't sure about that, but he made it clear that the oil wealth of the country would henceforth be used to benefit the poor, the underprivileged sections of society, it would be money spent on health, education, housing. It would be money spent on aiding neighboring states trying to embark on similar policies. It was an internationalist program. Once his enemies, that is the old ruling elite in the country and the United States realized that he was serious, Washington, and one of their EU satellites, Spain, decided to organize a military coup. The Venezuelan and global media ratcheted up the rhetoric. And in order to undermine it, they said this was a dictatorship. This is what they were hoping, that Hugo Chavez would become a dictator, that he would dissolve the assemblies, but why should he? He had actually argued very strongly for more democracy, saying that Venezuelan democracy was too limited. He had proposed a constitution, one of the most democratic, if not the most democratic in the world, granting Venezuelans the right to recall, over which there's been a, a debate recently as well. So painting him as a dictator was the time-honored Western way of building up support to try and topple him. And this they did via a coup in 2002. Of course, the coup d'etat failed. And the reason it failed is that though the top brass of the army, or most of it, was ready to play the American game, Many junior officers, and certainly rank-and-file soldiers, said that they weren't going along with this. And this coupled with the fact that there was a huge demonstration, mass mobilization by the poor, where people came down from the slums to show their support for Chavez, that it became impossible to keep him out of power. He was back at the Miraflores Palace within 48 hours, more popular than ever before. Now, why didn't they learn from this? That it is best to wait, try and remove leaders democratically, outvote them. Over the 10-year period, from 2000 to 2010, 
U.S. agencies, including the U.S. Agency for International Development, USAID, and its Office for Transition Initiatives, set up in Caracas in 2002, channeled more than $100 million to the opposition groups in Venezuela, the overall objective was straightforward. Regime change. So what price democracy? And <clears throat> this money was used by some of the groups to arm themselves, it's obvious, to get training. The most extreme right-wing faction of the opposition is semi-fascist in character. There's no doubt about it. This doesn't go for the entire opposition, of course. Many of them are revivals of the old two parties that dominated the state prior to Chavez. But the untimely <clears throat> and tragic death of Hugo Chavez in March 2013 created a new situation. Now two things happened. Politically at home, the opposition leaders assumed that Nicolas Maduro, the new president, would be a pushover, that they could get rid of him very quickly. Uh, they tried to do so. There was a huge uh, movement they built up, but it failed. Secondly, and more disastrously for the government, and this, of course, affected every single government in the world, the collapse in global oil prices was devastating, completely devastating for Venezuela. It was an oil revenue account for approximately 95% of export earnings, 60% of budget revenues, and 12% of GDP. The country's economy was thus reliant on income from this sector, which the Bolivarian government had utilized in order to fund ambitious social programs at a time when prices were consistently high in the mid-2000s. Now, this fall in oil prices, of course, affected Russia as well, it affected many of the Arab countries, but it affected Venezuela even more because of its dependence on oil to carry the rest of the economy and to use the oil reserves and the money generated by them for the popular things that they did, which are popular to this day. A large transformation in the lives of the poor of that country. I remember very well President Chavez telling me when I was there in 2003, I asked him, what was your most difficult time? Was it the coup? He said no, it wasn't the coup, uh, because I knew that the soldiers and people the poor wouldn't uh, allow this coup to go, uh, go through. I was worried, but not so worried. He said what really worried me was the oil strike that the old oligarchs had called for because they knew what we were going to do to the oil. When we attempted to take over the oil industry, they called a strike by corrupt trade unions in order to bring the country to a halt economically. And he said they succeeded to a certain extent. All the country's middle class layers went on strike. People who were very hostile to us for reasons of class, and he could have added race. So I asked him, why was this? He said, because when you have half your country against you, or less than half, but almost a half, trying to paralyze the country, what you worry about is the effect this might have on the poor. And he said, I thought, if the poor don't have enough to eat, if there's no distribution system working, will they turn against me? And then he said something very interesting. He said, what revived me and all of us was one day I went for a walk in the streets in the poorest parts of Caracas. And he said people had said if there's no beer in the shops, these young unemployed kids organized in gangs are going to riot and bring the government down. He said these kids walked up to me 
and said, Comandante, do not worry. We can live without beer, but don't let these bastards grind you down. Fight them. He said, then I went in and a woman came up to me and said, come and meet my family. He said, a poor family <clears throat> which lived in two, two and a half rooms. And he said, I went up with her. And she said, look, and he said, in the middle of the room, they were burning one of the doors of the house to heat some water to cook a meal with vegetables. And she said, this is what we're doing. We want you to carry on fighting. Don't think that because they are putting us through this, we're going to uh, be defeated. She said, and after we've burned this door, we'll burn the other door, we'll burn the front door, we'll burn our beds, but you don't stop fighting. And this is, of course, what gave Chavez enormous confidence that the poor were with him. The global oil crisis created an economic crisis in the country. The regime's enemies of course, used it uh, as best they could to try and stop the uh, flow of goods to make it worse, but it has to be said here. And uh, friends of the Bolivarian Revolution would not be friends if they kept this to themselves. Mistakes were made by the government. It panicked effectively. Its economists didn't know what to do. There was conflicting advice coming from all sides. We all know that mistakes were made, but these are mistakes that are made by many governments, not just in Venezuela, but in the West. The reason they become explosive in countries like Venezuela uh, is because there is an opposition waiting, like vultures, being controlled from Washington and constantly in touch with Washington. And it's these people who decided now, this is the time to hit Nicolas Maduro. And they decided to go on an offensive and on a street offensive. They tried that before, it hadn't worked. Then some of their leaders had tried to compromise, other leaders, of the opposition and accused the ones trying to reach a compromise settlement as sellouts for even talking to the regime. And now we have what appears to be a united opposition, but isn't. Now, it's an extremely difficult uh, situation for any government. But I think the solution to this crisis uh, was uh, made more difficult by the elections to the National Assembly in 2015. The last campaign Hugo Chavez fought was in 2013. During that campaign, ill but not showing signs of it, exhausted, he told the country day after day. I was in Caracas at the time and just watching him exhausted me. Where did he find the energy from? He knew what was at stake. He knew he didn't have long to live. And this campaign was his swan song, his appeal to the people of Venezuela to trust the project, to trust what he was trying to do, and they did. Even Capriles, the principal opposition leader and the opposition's presidential candidate, spoke at that time about reconciliation and the need for national unity. He mobilized in the barrios and the traditional Chavista heartlands, promising to maintain the social programs and comparing himself to Lula in Brazil, something that Lula was disgusted by. But Caprilo was then to run against Chavez's successor, Nicolas Maduro, the following year, and only fell short by a couple of 100,000 votes. Once again, they screamed murder. They said they'd been cheated. But all the foreign observers and most of the OAS, the Organization of American States, accepted that what had happened was a close-run thing, but that 
Maduro and the Chavistas had won. After two presidential elections being lost, Capriles' position was weakened. So who organized the protests of 2013? Capriles called for demonstrations immediately after he lost the presidential elections because the result was close. In the demonstrations, eight people were killed in those protests. All of them were government supporters. Leopold Lopez, then, the leader of the extreme right in Venezuela, accused Capriles of conceding defeat too easily. His Voluntad Popular wanted to keep the momentum of street protests and mobilizations against the government going, so that fed into the student demonstrations of February 2014, which were externally funded and whipped up by Lopez and his ally, the mayor of Caracas. The city had fallen to the opposition. Yet another demonstration that democracy in Venezuela has not faltered, where the opposition wins, like when they win the mayoralty in Caracas and other cities, they're allowed to carry on functioning, and they do function. There were 47 people killed during those riots in 2014 when opposition supporters were doing things like stringing wire across streets to decapitate pro-government motorcyclists. Leopoldo Lopez explicitly called on the students to come out on the streets to demonstrate and bring down the government. When he was arrested on charges of inciting violence and sent to prison, he claimed he had never called for them to overthrow the government, but every single piece of evidence, including many things he said, uh, were taped, and so there was no doubt about it. Now, he was arrested made into a martyr. So why the shock and horror when the government in Venezuela does exactly the same thing against someone inciting people to violence? Uh, made into a martyr, declared a political prisoner, etc., etc. In fact, the fellow, as is well known even within the opposition circles, is an extremist and a rogue. And the fact that the United States doesn't say so in public doesn't mean that they don't know this. Faced with this crisis, the government could have reacted in two ways, like most governments would have done. The first, of course, and the simplest response on their part would have been to uh, carry out acts of repression, which Maduro was reluctant to do, and for good reasons, because it would have escalated the situation further. The second would have been to mobilize the Chavista grassroots, which could have been done, but that would have been dangerous, because if it had led to direct clashes, there would have been charges that the government and not the opposition was provoking a civil war situation in the country. So he did neither, which annoyed many people in his own ranks, but on this particular question, I don't think there's any doubt uh, that he was right. How long he will be patient in the current situation remains an open question. So the, the thing that has to be settled effectively is this. Is the opposition going to wait till the constitutional period for the next election comes round next year? And if not, why not? What are they frightened of? They have a majority in the National Assembly. This majority is larger than it should be because a foolish mistake made by Hugo Chavez uh, and successive governments uh, has been to have National Assembly votes on the basis of first-past-the-post system, which means they are not proportional. So how far the opposition will go will depend, of course, on what the people guiding it, advising it, and encouraging it 
from another part of the world, i.e. North America, want to see. With Trump, it is not easy to see what his policy in South America is going to be, but if it is a continuation of Hillary Clinton and Obama and before them Bush and before him the other Clinton, then it will be an attempt to bring down the regime. All the indications are that they will, and Trump being someone who doesn't wear a mask has made two attacks on Venezuela already, two verbal attacks, of course, calling it a dictatorship, etc., etc. We will see what happens, but the situation is certainly extremely serious. This domination of South America by the United States, of course, goes a long, long way back. It starts with the Monroe Doctrine, which made it clear to other imperial powers, mainly European, not to even come close to South America, politically or militarily. It was in the sphere of influence of the United States. That's what the Monroe Doctrine said, and that's what the United States implemented ever since. They intervened numerous times in Central America, in Mexico, they organized coup d'etats, military dictatorships in Chile, in Argentina, in Brazil over the last century. So the notion that this uh, imperial beast has changed its spots is, of course, nonsense. It uses a different rhetoric. Writing in 1924 in Mornings in Mexico, the novelist and essayist D. H. Lawrence had a few words to say. What is interesting in the language he uses is the fact that he uses white as a way of describing the monkey, whereas monkeys was the way in which imperial powers constantly and always described the people they were ruling. And the word monkey was used a great deal during the early years of Hugo Chavez's victories in Venezuela. There was a well-known occasion where the opposition were at a party with the US ambassador present when some Bulgarian actors who had been hired came dressed as monkeys and Chavistas. And in opposition talk, the Chavistas were always referred to as the Chavista monkeys because fewer countries in South America, while all have strong racist streaks in relation to the indigenous people, in Venezuela this racism went very deep indeed. D. H. Lawrence's words, written in 1924, are a reminder of where the real power lies. Lawrence writes, the great white monkey has got hold of the keys of this world, and the black-eyed Mexican has to serve the great white monkey in order to live. He has to learn the tricks of the great white monkey show. Time of the day, coin of money, machines that start at a second, work that is meaningless and yet is paid for with exactitude, in exact coin a whole existence of monkey tricks and monkey virtues, the strange money virtue of charity, the white monkeys nosing around to help, to save. Could any trick be more unnatural? Yet it is one of the tricks of the great white monkey. What is the great white monkey up to in Venezuela today? It's hardly a secret. The great white monkey has the opposition parties on his payroll. They are doing his bidding. They have been learning these tricks since 1998 and now have perfected some of them. And against the great white monkey and his Venezuelan allies is a beleaguered regime. A regime which, despite mistakes that have been made, remains one of the more progressive administrations in the history of the country.